Yeah, how far away are we from starting, do you think? I mean, looks like it could be now. Yeah, I think we could start now. All right, well, I guess I won't play my exciting game of Tetris anymore, but, you know, that's... Welcome to the Lisp Machine in GNU. Uh, is everybody ready for an exciting talk? Well, too bad you showed up to this one then, but I'll do my best. Um, uh, so, uh, welcome to Amateur History Hour. Um, so this is about what some of the, a lot of people have heard the backstory about, you know, RMS for, and the printer. There's even a bit of RMS and the Harvard inspiring, you know, GNU and his work on free software. I'm not going to talk about either of those. I'm going to talk about the way that Lisp has informed and also um, the, the, the conflicts that inspired the GNU project to where it is today. Um, and uh, since I am absolutely terrible, um, I am going to do this presentation entirely in Emacs, expanding org mode. I keep telling myself I will never do that again, and I'm doing it. Um, and uh, so, GNU, huh? What's GNU? GNU, it's not Unix. It's a free operating system, but most importantly, it's a vision for an operating system in which everyone is free to be able to explore and develop um, and share and contribute together, right? Um, uh, and, and being not Unix is the coolest, right? Um, or at least so I felt, you know, coming from Windows and DOS and et cetera. Um, and Unix has a lot of nice features. It didn't invent all these, but it's very portable because of C. It has a hierarchical file system. It has a command line that you can, you know, do all sorts of stuff and feel all so cool in. Uh, everything's a file. Uh, plain text everywhere. What's that? Okay, I'll try to speak more slowly. I did put a little bit too much content in here, so. Um, uh, but so, so Unix seems like, a, a, being a not Unix seems like the coolest, but maybe there are downsides. Um, maybe, um, one, one example is manual man uh, um, memory management, uh, which not everybody sees as a downside, but it can run into problems. For example, what's GNU, right? Well, GNU's not Unix, which expands to GNU's not Unix, and the GNU, you know, you can see the letters here, they expand to GNU's not Unix, which expands to GNU's not Unix, and then suddenly you have a stack overflow and, you know, you have a security problem, right? So, um, so there's, some of these properties are really exciting, but, you know, some of them, you know, you can run into difficulties like this. Um, the, one of the other challenges, oh, forgot to do this, uh, of uh, use, doing a uh, um, Unix is that um, by encouraging plain text everywhere, but not having kind of a generalized structure, um, and many of the tools just operating on strings is that you end up in these problems where you just kind of shove together strings and descendances and then this, the structure of them breaks, right? You see this in the classic, you know, um, uh, the classic problems with uh, in injection and tax on the shell and uh, um, in SQL and et cetera. But if you've ever piped anything to exargs on the command line, you know how bad that is, right? Um, and, uh, and as an example, if you ever tried to combine together two different regular expressions into one place, you'll know you're going to have a really bad time. Well, now we're going to start jumping into the Lisp side of things, because if you, were have, if you had parentheses everywhere, then you could actually compose them together from a nice structure, and they would work. So there's a, a ledger command line, an, uh, um, like, accounting system that uses plain text, and I was able to write a terrible parser using regular expressions, and all of the components could compose together, which is so great. And I would challenge you to try to do the same um, with kind of a stringly typed system. Um, but this is not a Unix hating talk. There's a whole book for that called the Unix Haters Handbook. It is as curmudgeonly as you would expect. Um, but being a not Unix has some nice properties, but maybe not Unix is not the only game in town, right? So we'll, we'll travel back in time. And there's this idea of this thing called the Lisp Machine, um, and it was developed here at MIT back, back in the day, and it has some nice things. Uh, it's dynamic, and um, it has both it interpreted, but it can also be compiled, so you'd write, it has the kind of fun, you're playing around with things aspect, but it would also be very efficient. Um, it has garbage collection built in. Eventually, it even had garbage collection built in at a hardware level. Um, and you can kind of explore anywhere in the system um, from top to bottom. Uh, like, you want to find out why this thing is breaking, you can go down the stack of the whole system and just kind of inspect it. Um, it had a built-in wi windowing framework, and this is back in the 70s, um, and mouse-driven contacts that did useful things. 
Um, and if you ever use a command line and you're like, oh, wouldn't it be really nice if I could have, you know, I could, every now and then somebody's like, we should reinvent the shell so that, you know, you can do cool things like list files or, you know, make links work and do useful things. Well, list machines had that. In fact, well, this is something taken from the idea of a list machine, but I'm not going into details. But here's somebody's listing a directory, and you can see that it actually gives a visual presentation. And that's because the output of these things could give structured data that form the system what they want to do. So you'd, you can do... You can use... But I'm not saying machines a path idea. Um, one thing user, um, by design, uh, there's also no process isolation uh, in case you worry about things like that. Um, they also required special hardware, and they're also dead. They're gone, right? Um, you know, um, they were born somewhere around 1974, and they were garbage collected somewhere between 87 and 1990, probably. There's a manual watching over this here, inside joke. Um, but, but they're no longer along, around. Um, but what's really interesting, right before, um, RMS was working on list machines, and instead chooses to make GNU a, a not Unix. And why was that done, right? So let's, let's find out. But to do that, we need to look at what Lisp is. Um, and to look at what, we have to ask why. So Lisp stands for, as a backronym, one of many. Lisp is syntactically pure. Um, uh, also, sometimes lots of irritating uh, silly parentheses, but I like this other one. Um, it's very conceptually lean, but you can kind of build almost anything on top of that, and that's because of these things called S expressions, which have parentheses everywhere. Um, and you can have code that writes code, a very nice property. Um, the inv development environment for writing in any Lisp is very much so a living environment. You can often modify and kind of shape the code of the clo code while it runs. You don't need to restart your web server during the, mi uh, the middle of it every time you make a change or even have it do it automatically. You can kind of evolve the system as it runs. Uh, David Thompson even has a, some game engine projects where you can change the game as the game is actually running, which is really cool, right? Um, Distinctions between interpreted and compiled, depending on the Lisp, you might not have those. And so Lisp seems to have everything, and you can, you can just get, Lisp, uh, get it if it doesn't, right? And, but still, a lot of people are scared by it, so let's, let's show you that it's not scary. Uh, here's what Lisp is, right? So we can have numbers, one, two, three. Uh, I can also add them together, like this, right? Plus two, three. Plus, in this case, is, you know, it's the addition function, right? except that it's appearing at the front, which is not too far away if, you know, sometimes those are infix, but you might think of something like this, right? Like, uh, you, know, you know, in Python you might do print um, hello world, whereas in Scheme we'll do display hello world. And we'll also type new line. Uh, but anyway, uh, but the, but so, so you can see, but what's also kind of cool is that these things start to compose together. So we could do plus two and then times four or five. Well, we know four and five is gonna become 20. So when we add those together, it's 22. And, and yeah, you can see this is just kind of, it's the same as that, you know? It kind of, it kind of like flows down. You can see how things are, are moving. And that's pretty cool. Um, it's also, you know, it's really not too hard. We can do something, you can also do something interesting. You see the plus there. Well, it's a procedure normally, but I can quote it and suddenly it's just this symbol. Um, we can also do something like hello, you know, uh, hello, Libre Planet. We could even make a list of those. Or heck, why don't we just quote the whole thing? And what's interesting about this is that when you've got that little tick there, it doesn't, um, it doesn't actually run it. The thing at the front is no longer a function, it's just giving you its data. Right? It's saying we're in data mode now. Uh, and that's pretty cool. And it's especially cool because now we could also do the thing that we did do before of plus two and three. And now it's just like that, right? It's just data. We switch between code, where there's no quote, and data where there is a quote, or actually in reverse from what I just said. Uh, but, uh, um, but we can also do this crazy thing called quasi-quote. I know I'm starting to get insane now. I'm like, this is so simple, and then I just start adding things. Well, here, now we're data on the outside with that back tick, but then when we do this comma thing, that part will be evaluated. So now, plus two and six, but we've left that bit in there. Well, wait a minute. This looks just like this type of code that I'd write normally, like, you know, if it's a string, 
you know, like, hey, then I'd say, that's a string, um, or not a string, right? You know, so you, but you could also just quote this thing, um, and you can also imagine that you can start, you could even quasi-quote it, and you could actually start to build syntax forms where somebody maybe passed in the, you know, the predicate here, right? And now, suddenly, you're able to write code that writes code. And that's really cool, because now you're not beholden to whatever the language designers are going to do. And in fact, we're going to, let's, let's move on. Um, language exploration and Lisp is a wonderful thing. Um, so in other languages, you have to be like, please, language developers, please give me this feature, right? A great example is in Python, we have this, um, there's a new feature that came in Python 3 called yield from, and it allowed coroutines to be able to kind of lock together and move at the same time. But you needed Python 3, and if your Python 2 code, if you didn't have it, it didn't work. Well, Paul Tag wrote a hilarious, terrible thing called Hi, which is a Lisp that transforms into Python. And so since now it's a Lisp and you have got this, this structure, well, he just wrote yield from in Python 2, and now you've got it. You don't need to wait for anybody, you just have it. Um, so that's pretty great. Even though Hi is not the best Lisp, it's still good enough to do that. Um, it's not Paul Tag's fault, it's Python's fault, to be fair. Um, uh, but I love Python, by the way. Media Goblin's written in Python. Uh, so anyway, Lisp and Lisp, you can also do things where once you have a Lisp, it's very easy to build a Lisp on top of it. And then you can start to play with it. You want to write something prologue-like? You can do it. Uh, um, whatever you want to do, you can start exploring language ideas. And so as it turns out, Lispers tend to explore language ideas before everyone else, which leads to this problem. Lispers, the Cassandras of computer science. Um, the problem is, they, they're cursed with the knowledge of what features everybody's going to want, and nobody believes them because they say, you've got those parentheses everywhere, I can't deal with it. Right, so this is the curse of being a Lisper. Um, but it's also maybe, so Lisp, what's a Lisp, right? I showed you Scheme, but I also said Emacs is written in Lisp, and there's actually completely separate lists here. So here's a quote I like. Um, from before common lisp happened, um, I'm just going to read it out loud. Scott Fallman, I think, said, the last Mac lisp community is not in a state of chaos. It consists of four well-defined groups going in four well-defined directions. Uh, this is prior to the standardization of common lisp. Um, so there's quite a few lists. Uh, for example, the, some of the classics. Common lisp did a lot of unification in the 1980s. Not everybody was happy with the unification. Uh, Stallman told me very pointedly he doesn't like keywords, but I think they're great. Um, has like common list object system and stuff like that. Uh, scheme, you know, um, has a really clean foundation. It's easy to implement. Uh, also the world's most unportable programming language by its own committee. Uh, I love it. <laughs> it's so great. Uh, and Emacs Lisp, the, the very, this editor that I'm running in now is itself written in a Lisp, and I can just evaluate things, and they happen. I can write Tetris here, and I can evaluate it, and Tetris starts running. <laughs> I love it, right? And if that wasn't enough, I could also be like, well, what is Tetris? And I can jump straight to the source code, and here's what Tetris is. Here's the code. My god! All the Tetris, right? Why would you use any other editor? What is wrong with you? Use Emacs. Um, so anyway, it has a terrible Kluge foundation, but it's kind of the workhorse of, this, of the text editing world. And it comes with a kitchen sink and, and then some. Um, but there's also some more modern lists. For example, Clojure, in case you like Java and also functional data structures. Um, not, the license is not compatible with the GPL, unfortunately. And then Hi, Paul Tag's terrible, wonderful list that runs on top of Python. Uh, also has a great logo, uh, but the original is down here, the ASCII art. Anyway, there's a whole slew of other ones. I didn't even jump into all of them because there are too many. It is so easy to write a Lisp that so many people have written Lisps, which is great, maybe terrible, mostly great, though. All right. Lisp is beautiful. Now, one of the things about Lisp is that people are like, oh, those parentheses are just everywhere, right? But here's, here's Geeks, a package manager written in Scheme. And here's the definition for grep. It's pretty readable, right? You can see the package, the name, the version, and, other, and, and this is written in Scheme, but mostly readable. But maybe you're like, not readable enough, Chris Weber. 
I see those parentheses. Well, what if here is something called WISP, which transforms a white space significant language into S expressions? Well, that looks really readable, even if you're familiar with Algol or, you know, Python or whatever, right? That looks super familiar. And in fact, I showed my friend Shishish this, and he's like, wow, looking at the white space version made me actually think that maybe the parenthesis version is not so bad. <laughs> it's not so bad. It's great. And in fact, I mean, look at this. Once you have your editor, look, it's highlighting the structure of it. I can, like, shape things in and out. It's like, it's crazy. It's the best. It's the best. Use lists. All right. Let's keep going. Ah, uh, so let's get to the timeline of lists. Unfortunately, there's too much timeline. I spent weeks reading list history when I should have been doing other things. Um, and so let's, let's get into it. So some kind of the prehistory of Lisp. Um, in, the, in the late 50s, that's how long Lisp has been around. Um, the, John McCarthy starts, gets inspired at a conference about, oh, I should make an algebraic Lisp processing language. He saw another Lisp processing language that was not cool like Lisp. And he's like, that's a pretty good idea. And then, you know, over the next couple of years, they build an actual Lisp. I think it was written in an assembly at the time. Um, uh, maybe not. Fortran, okay. Um, and he writes this paper, Recursive Functions of Symbolic exp uh, Expressions and Their Recomputation by Machine, Part 1. Part 2 was never published. Uh, <laughs> but this is how cool this language is. Inside of the paper on Lisp, there's a definition of Lisp written in Lisp. And in fact, this is so cool that Steve Russell, um, who's there, says, this is so great, why don't we just write an interpreter that uses that whole thing you wrote there? And then they did, and then suddenly you had a live hacking environment, and they originally were planning on not having the parentheses everywhere, but by the time that that happened, everyone loved the parentheses. There was no going back. Parentheses are the best. Um, and Phyllis Fox wrote the documentation. Uh, I, she, there's a great quote here that nobody in that quote or group ever wrote down anything. McCarthy was furious that they didn't document the code, but he wouldn't do it either. So I learned enough lists that I could write it down, uh, some questions, and, and write some more. Thanks, Phyllis Fox, so that we, you know, list did not hit the dustbin of his, uh, history. But there's tons of cool things happening here, like garbage collection. Put in there as a hand wave, like memory management, this is really tough. Well, garbage collection, that'll handle it. They didn't even know how it was going to work. It's just that garbage collection will do it. And then eventually figure it out. And this is at a time where Lisp comes up with new ideas, like if else. If else did not exist in a language at that time. Am I correct on that? I think so, yes. So this is a time where Lisp is both coming up with garbage collection, but also if else. <laughs> like. Anyway, so in the 1960s and 70s, kind of the AI lab hacker culture kind of develops, and it kind of develops alongside Lisp. Not everybody was using Lisp. A lot of people were writing an assembly on the incompatible time-carrying system, but they kind of developed together at the same time. And there's especially one Lisp that's here that's very popular called MacLisp, and I believe that's the one that had the four incompatible directions. Um, but the main problem is that it's pretty slow. Um, and uh, at this time, RMS was actually here at the Hacker Lab and kind of found it as his community, really appreciated the sharing, working with other individuals, and et cetera. Um, there's all sorts of cool other things happening here. The Lambda papers came out in this time period, I believe. Um, the, uh, um, so schemes started to be developed. Uh, and then comes the list machine. You know, my, the, and there's, the first one's called cons, because that's how you put two things together in a list. The second one's called catter, because that's how you get to the second element. Um, and then, uh, so RMS actually becomes one of the maintainers of Lisp Machine Lisp at this time. Well, there's a problem. So in the early 1980s, people are like, these Lisp machines are so great, how do we get them out there? Also, we can make some money. Um, and two Lisp Machines companies start. So one of them, uh, they're both taking the Catter design, which is the second design, um, and Richard Greenbratt starts, I believe, was the first one to suggest this idea of starting the company, but he founds Lisp Machines Incorporated, and he says, well, we want to preserve the hacker culture, so we won't take outside investors. Um, and we'll ha hire hackers part-time, et cetera, so that way, that way we can keep this hacker community alive. And uh, Russell Nofsterker, I, I could never pronounce that because I've only ever read it and never heard it. Um, Nofster, well, whatever. Uh, so he took venture capitalist money and thus was able to hire a lot more people. Um, well, this is where things start to fracture. 
So MIT signed an agreement that said that Symbolics and List Machines Incorporated, I know this is a huge wall of text, must share their changes with MIT, but it doesn't say that you, that they actually have to, um, that it doesn't give permission for those changes made by those companies for MIT to redistribute them again. And this becomes a problem. So first, for the first year, this is no problem. People just share the stuff anyway. You get the stuff from Symbolics or LMI, you just share it. It doesn't matter. But then, Symbolics like, wait, we're doing most of the work. We're getting, making most of the advancements right now. Um, so there's this email that's sent, quoted up there, I'm not gonna read it in full, that basically says, um, hey, so MIT can use our software, but you can't share it. You can't distribute it. Um, and uh, if you talk to Stallman, at least, the, uh, I, well, this Machines Incorporated did sign the same agreement. It was drafted by MIT's lawyers. Um, RMS says that it basically made his work proprietary, but he sticks on for two years mainly to punish Symbolics because he was so upset that he believed that they were destroying hacker culture by making it so that you could no longer share the code. So two years after this, what happens? RMS... Um, ends up publishing the GNU announcement two years later. And this is one of the big things that actually leads to publishing the GNU thing, the GNU um, initial announcement. It's not just that a printer was very frustrating, and there's more to the story than just a frustrating printer, right? But it's also that there was a community, and the community was taken away by an agreement that said you can't share anymore. And I think that that's really important. That's one of the reasons why I think this part of the talk is so important. Well, now we're gonna jump to a bit of non-GNU stuff because I think it's interesting. Um, in the mid to late 80s, various things happen. Common Lisp kind of consolidates. It brings together those four different directions of, uh, of Mac Lisp. Also, Scheme gets standardized. Uh, I had a TARDIS at the top. I think Gerald Sussman kind of pioneered this look of, uh, uh, in Doctor Who. Um, and uh, um, doesn't have anything to do with that, of course, but it was a funny picture. Um, but anyway, but. Symbolics did do a lot of things, was kind of the company that did run really far along. And in fact, this is kind of a really cool interface picture. And it's kind of hard to see from here, but there's a 3D model pro program going on here. These are curves for an animation system, and every part of this interface you can interact with, kind of like how I can in Emacs here, where you can find out the source code of it and explore and dive in into it. Now, granted, you're legally not allowed to actually have full permission to mess with the thing, but you can explore the whole thing. So it's a cool direction, but still legally hampered. But it's also important to note that around this time, there were a bunch of different list machines, and Symbolics, unfortunately, does die out. Um, but GNU, there were also a lot of Unixes that were incompatible. And what saved Unix, in a way, was GNU making a not Unix. It's possible, it's probable, that if Symbolics had instead freed their software, that we would have ended up having these list designs that continue. Well, that's not the direction we got. The AI boom that was happening at the time was oversold. The venture capital pulls out. We're in another AI boom, might happen again. Uh, Symbolics didn't re free this code, so it disappeared. But this is the future we could have had if that code lived along. Look at this man's glorious mullet. This is from a Symbolics promotional video. He's at a list machine. He's got a glass of wine there. If only this was the future we had, unfortunately. Um, so let's get to lisping GNU, right? GNU head with lots of parentheses around it. Why Unix? Why not a Lisp machine? If it's so cool, why not do it? Well, there's a couple of reasons. And this actually was a big conflict for RMS. Was he going to make it a GNU, uh, make GNU a Unix, or was he going to make it a Lisp machine? And Lisp machines required special hardware. Basically, if you wanted to add two things together, and one of them's a string, in order to make your program and the rest of the system not crash, it had to know what the, the type of that system was. And in hardware, list machines had special hardware that knew what all the types were. Um, and unfortunately, that makes it very hard to port. Uh, GNU is supposed to run on conventional hardware, not just this kind of special purpose list machine hardware. So this is the main reason why GNU is a Unix and not a list machine, is that, it's, is that it was very portable and it could run on pretty much any hardware. Um, it's also true that, as you saw, there's a lot of fracturing of different types of Lisp, and doing, choosing the right Lisp machine design would be a research effort, and it could have been wrong. Um, so, um, whoop, what did I just do? Oh, there we go. Whew. Uh, so anyway, but what's interesting is that even in the initial announcement, 
C and Lisp were supposed to be the two primary languages of GNU. So instead, Lisp would become a user space program on top of Unix. And you wouldn't have to make all the right decisions about how it's going to work. You could figure those out as you go. Um, it would be portable because the basis could be written in C. And, um, and this is actually mentioned in the initial li uh, Lisp announcement. They even suggested instead of X windows, uh, the future, the present that we got, that maybe we would have a Lisp based uh, windowing management system or something like that. But anyway, so we didn't get a Lisp machine, but maybe we got something a little bit like it. We have Emacs. So what's Emacs? It's an editor. It's got a C core, but it's extensible in Lisp. In fact, the C core is very small. And the amount of Lisp is so large that if I had this C core, it would probably fill the room, right? Um, and the great thing about Emacs is that just by configuring it, you end up extending it. And you extend it while it runs. It's a live, extendable system. And in fact, I'm not a computer science major. I was an interdisciplinary humanities major that wrote my papers in LaTeX. I learned to become a programmer by extending Emacs. So Emacs is a gateway drug into you know, the world of programming. Um, and Emacs can do everything, you know? Let's play some more Tetris. Okay, well, wait, let's not play some more Tetris. But, you know, you want to write, e read email? You can do it in Emacs. You want to run Wireworld, which is a cool, like, oh, should have really set this up ahead of time. Uh, which is a cool, like, it's like, you can, like, simulate these little electrons moving around. You can do that. When I was supposed to be working on this talk, I wrote a Wireworld simulator where you can write little ASCII art circuits and you can make computers and stuff like that. What's more fun than working on your talk about Emacs and Lisp and stuff? Writing a computer simulator in Emacs and Lisp and stuff. And you can do it because Emacs. So, it also can edit source code, apparently. Um, so the history of Emacs. GNU Emacs is not the first Emacs. Way back in the day, um, there was ITS Emacs that ran on the incompatible time-sharing system. And primarily de developed and maintained by RMS, so there were a lot of other people involved. Um, and it also had a terrible extension language called Tico. Just the worst. Look up some Tico code later, and you will cry. It was not Lisp. But it doesn't matter. It was the world's first full screen editor. Before then, full screen editors didn't exist. So anyway, um, but GNU Emacs takes a C core with Lisp on top of it. And it was in, wasn't the first one to do that. Multix Emacs actually started out with Lisp um, from the very beginning and was Lisp from the, all the way out. Had some adjustments to Multix to make it workable. But there's also some other one, which I talked to RMS, I think he doesn't know the name of, that had the kernel with the user space list. But what's really cool is that GNU Emacs is GNU's first program, the first of the modern GNU world. And it's still alive. People are writing tons of terrible and wonderful Emacs Lisp code to this day. It's so great and terrible. Anyway, so is GNU Emacs the poor man's Lisp machine? Well, it kind of looks like it, right? So here's the Lisp machine. Um, whoop, up this one. This one's the Lisp machine. And it looks a lot like Emacs. This is the Symbolics proprietary one, but whatever. But you can even see there's a mini buffer in there. There's like an editor and et cetera. It's like, gosh, it just looks so much like Emacs. In fact, I kind of reproduced the same image in Emacs. And there it is. It looks so similar. But the thing is, is that uh, um, Reiner Joswig, or Joswig, he pretty much yelled at me. He's like, that's not a Lisp machine. Lisp machine's like a special type of hardware and an operating system. It had Emacs, but it was just a subroutine. You could have an Emacs in any program. This one's got Emacs as its own program. Well, OK. Emacs might not actually be a Lisp machine, but it carries on, in a certain sense, a certain amount of the tradition of the Lisp machine, and also just plain old Lisp. Thank you. So, whoa, oh god, I just turned this buffer into wire world mode. We are screwed. <laughs> we are screwed. Oh, it recovered. <sighs> See, I didn't actually add key bindings for the thing that I'm using, the very terrible Emacs Lisp I did to move forward slides in org mode. So I just ran the last command, which turned my buffer into wire world. But we moved on. It worked. <sighs> Emacs Lisp is terrible and glorious. Um, so anyway, Guile and the Emacs thesis. So this idea that, OK, our system is not a Lisp machine. But we've got this C base, and we can put Lisp things on top of it. Well, it wasn't. A completely originally that this, this, the idea that this, well, 
after Emacs, GNU Emacs was seen to be successful, at that point it was understood that this is actually a pretty good idea. We should just spread this across the rest of GNU. And so Guile was a scheme, there are many schemes, uh, that is embeddable, highly embeddable in C. And the idea was we're gonna bring Emacs to everything. Um, didn't quite happen. Though in a certain sense, some of my favorite programs are still kind of Emacs like. Blender is very Emacs like with all the lists, but it has a core, then you can extend the whole thing like that. Uh, GNU Cache actually does follow this view. And Vim, I had an interesting conversation with a friend of mine who said, you know, the thing that saved Vi is that it became an Emacs, you know, had a core and then you could extend it. Anyway, this idea of being able to extend things, hopefully with Lisp, is uh, something that hasn't completely catched on, but has in some ways. Um, but what are we gonna do now, right? What's the future of GNU and Guile? And I did not size my images correctly in this part, or of GNU and Lisp in general. Well, a particular Lisp that I like, though there are many Lisps within GNU, probably too many Lisps, GNU itself seems to have that Lisp fracturing explosion that the rest of Lisp does. Um, but anyway, Guile is maybe the best. Um, no, it's not the best. It's just my favorite. Uh, but, it, um, but anyway, 2.2 release came out, has a really cool fast virtual machine. You wanna experiment with language design or just want to up your programming skills or just wanna experiment with a Lisp, I recommend Guile. Geeks, I am running a distribution that is entirely based on Scheme. It's a functional distribution that turns your, e your whole computer into something like Git so you can travel backwards and forwards in time. Geeks is pretty cool, you should check it out. Uh, Shameless plug, I work on a thing called 8sync, which is like a guile, like actor model, thingamajig. I gave a talk at FOSDEM, you can look that up. But anyway, the whole point is, what else could happen, right? We're in an exciting, the, the world has not ceased to be exciting, despite Lisp having been around since the late 50s. Many more things are ahead. What will we do? What will you do? Anyway, that's the majority of my talk, unless we wanna go into bonus content. Thank you for listening. Some lessonings and reflections. Oh, I forgot I put up this slide. Lisp is beautiful, and it's not scary. It's just different. You can and should learn Lisp. It's not hard. You saw just a few simple concepts inside of that REPL. That's, you followed that. You followed almost all of Lisp. It's so simple. It has the same syntax for everything. Anyway, um, Lisp is also part of our heritage. It's part of our hacker culture, and hopefully part of our future. Anyway. That's it. Thank you, everyone. Um, line up on that side for questions. If you're on this side, I can, I have a microphone down here. Mandatory credits and documents. There. Any questions? Are we question free? Oh, no, not question free. Okay. Do you think that um, if Lisp, Lisp really was so perfect, it would more converge instead of fracturing, and that these sort of Amish-like fractal um, uh, distribution of different Lisps is because it might not be a real platonic reflection of some ideal, and, and what is your opinion on that? Oh, so basically, is Lisp not perfect as evidenced by its fracturing? Is that the question? Okay, so I think that part of the thing is is that if you have any really core beautiful system, you can fracture from there, always. Like if you have a core beautiful system, you can add abstractions, right? And you might make abstractions that are incompatible. But one of the nice things about Lisp is it starts with a very small core, right, with the lambda calculus, and sure, it does explode into a bunch of different dialects, but one of the reasons we have so many cool things in programming today is because Lisp was able to experiment with them. Now. I think the real takeaway is that that basic lambda calculus is enough to build anything, but it's not necessarily everything you want. And social dynamics being what it is, if you can build anything, and people are trying to figure out what anything should be, it's going to be very easy to end up breaking things apart. And in fact, I showed the common list thing earlier. I, one of the most amazing sta language standardization things in the world is the common list standardization effort, where you know bringing all those versions of the Mac list basically together and having a core compatible common list that still mostly works to today was an incredible achievement. But one of the things about Lisp is that people kind of fracture out, fractal out, and experiment with features. Some of them fizzle and die. A lot of the things I talked about are the great successes of Lisp, but some of them end up being terrible. 
and then they end up coming back together again, right? But that's a social effort. So we have a nice, good technological base, but there has to be a social effort to kind of bring unity. Now, the answer to what unity is, that's a difficult question. I'll just shy away from that one, right? Probably guile. No, wait, I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, other questions? Within the con within the context of the Sorry. lambda calculus, what is the difference between like Lisp one, one point five, I don't know, et cetera, and maybe Haskell? Okay, so what's the difference between Lisp one point five, et cetera, and Haskell? So right, so there's a good question there, right? The earliest lists captured most of the lambda calculus, so not everything was exactly gotten down. It took a long time for people to discover that le lexical scope is way better than dynamic scope, right? But, um, but if you're gonna say, maybe the big question is, the big questions are, between Lisp and Haskell, I think, are syntax, for one, right? Lisp has this syntax that you can make anything out of, right? And Haskell says that your basic composable functions are so good that as long as you have an application system that's called by need, you can make anything you want anyway. Now, it does mean you have to set up a lot of structures around monads and things like that, right? Um, some lisps can be absolutely purely functional the way that Haskell is. The lisps I like the most let you experiment. You can do completely purely functional, and you can also do things that involve mutation, and you can kind of explore those worlds. I mean, there are strongly typed lisps, um, as well, so it's really difficult to say. The big differences are, um, I mean, I think the big differences are probably, is it a typed, li is a typed version of lambda calculus, a strongly typed version of lambda calculus, and what's your syntax choice, and also how do you apply things? Those are the big, big differences. Um, Done in Lisp. What's it? What are they using now? Wait, the AI work in the '90s was using Lisp. What? What are they using now? What does what does Watson use? Oh, what is the AI world using now that it's not using Lisp? I don't know. I'm not an AI person. I think a lot of it's done in Python, right? Um, oh, Gerald Sussman, who has evolved both then and also knows about things now, should answer this question. It depends upon the problem. There we go, <laughs> Gerald Sussman. It depends upon the problem. The ultimate Lisp answer. Is not necessarily the right thing for it. However, uh, that's a you know the real story is you, a good engineer needs a big bag of tools, and you better have all of them. So there you go, straight from Gerald Sussman. The real answer is you gotta have a big bag of tools and pick what's right. All right, uh, do we have any time for any more questions or is that it? Six minutes. Six minutes, we have plenty of time for questions. Um, okay, we have a question over here. I mean, unless the people wanna see me do an example of defining a macro, but probably don't. Uh, first off, really interesting talk. Um, you showed this company that eventually died that made those list machines with that interesting interface that you could uh, manipulate in real time. Was any of their code ever opened up? You mean symbolics? What, did they end up opening any of their code? Yes. My impression is that there is a person at MIT, I wrote down this note somewhere, that has, um, let's see, symbolics. Um, there, well, no, I don't have it written down here. Apparently, somebody here at MIT has this access to the source, uh, like has the actual copyrights on the source code of Symbolics, and has said that they're going to release it freely, and hasn't done so. Uh, maybe somebody should find that person and encourage them to do it, because it would be a cool amount of Lisp history to explore, right? I mean, you know, I don't know if people are going to keep using it, but it would at least be cool to explore. The incompatible time-sharing system, there's been work to actually make that um, completely free software, um, Jason Self is somewhere in the audience. I know he's very familiar with that work that's been happening. Um, and I think being ex able to explore the heritage of our software, I'm sure Stefano Zaccaroli would agree, 
is an important thing, right? So um, I would love to see Symbolics released under a free license. Apparently somebody can do it. They should do it. Anything else? Oh, so there's an legal copy of open gen uh, generic floating around somewhere. Well, I mean, I try to not look at things that I can't use. So, but it's, it's, I mean, I guess maybe it's useful to someone. I'm just afraid to look at that stuff myself, lest I become tainted by knowledge I am forbidden to have. Um, yes, anybody else? Or are we at, oh. By the way, thank you all for being very patient for a talk that was a huge wall of text, as you can see in Emacs. You have all been very patient. Anyway. So this is a personal question just for you. A personal um, question. Uh oh Yes. What is the best thing that you think you've made using Lisp? Like the best thing I've made time. using Lisp? Oh, um, probably 8sync is probably the coolest. I haven't shown it here, but there's a talk that you can watch. I could try to pull it up. But anyway, I've written 8sync, which is an actor model system that um, allows you to write asynchronous, you know, programming environment type stuff, and all the actors can talk to each other. It spreads out nicely across machines, in theory at least. Um, and I also built a MUD on top of it, a multi-user dungeon. And a couple years ago, I might have hinted that I really like te multiplayer text adventures. It's a cool vi video at FOSDEM. What's really nice about it, though, my favorite thing about it is that it's designed so that it can be very live hackable, so that you can ex grow the world while it's running. And I actually think this is the, one of the most important features of Lisp, and maybe one of also the big differences between it and Haskell. Um, prob maybe actually the most important difference is that Lisp, if you've got a really good Lisp environment, the code that you're writing in your editor and the file and the code that's in that REPL that you play around with are not too different. You can evaluate, you can explore and grow the one that's in the file and actually evaluate it and it shoots it off to the process that's running. And through that, I was able to write a multiplayer world that people were able to walk around in, but I could add rooms as people suggested them, and I could fix things as they broke, right? You know, um, that I think is the coolest thing, being able to grow a world live, because you might not know exactly what you need. You can figure it out while it runs. Any other questions? One way in the back. I'm just, yeah, I'm just, I'm just giving Gerwitz some exercise, I guess. Um, uh, if possible, could you just expand on uh, what was specific about the hardware uh, for a Lisp machine that made it not Right, so I'm not the expert of this. I've actually never run a Lisp machine. I've just watched lots of videos and read lots of documentation of it because I'm a nerd like that. But the main, so do you want to talk about it? The question is, what was the main hardware difference between Lisp machines? I kind of touched on it with tag-valued architecture, but maybe you wanted to explain it. The big difference, what made the hardware of Lisp machines special? Well, the Lisp machine, the most important thing is that the data, all the data had a replaced for a tag, okay, such that the hardware could dispatch on the tag, the, a type tag. And that's, a, that's an enormous thing that makes it, uh, that gets rid of a lot of the overhead that we have with conventional hardware. Okay, that's, that's one thing, but also there was a microcode, it was a microcode machine that had made another level of interpreter, and so you could, in fact, make up new instructions and things. Right, right. It was right. a very nice machine. So, uh, unfortunately, of course, it was tiny in comparison to your cell phone. Right. So that's, that is a significant thing to highlight about the Lisp machines is that you could, is that they compiled actually to the machine language, so they were super efficient. Um, and yeah, the tag-valued architecture allowed it so that it wouldn't break. But uh, anyway, we're done. That's it. Thanks, everybody.